Welcome to the Overwatch Archives panel. Good morning. How is everybody? Thank you so much for being here. I am Jeff from the Overwatch team. I'm Arnold from the Overwatch team. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> so this is a panel that Arn and I are so super excited about. We think we're going to have so much fun this morning with you guys. Um, what the Overwatch Archives panel is, is a look at the making of the game. And it's really behind the scenes stuff that nobody's ever seen before. So we know BlizzCon's been about all the new cool announcements like Blizzard World and Moira and all that stuff. But now we get a chance to do something we don't normally do. Yes. Time to show some secrets. Secrets, past secrets. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk you guys through the timeline of how Overwatch got made. And it really starts back in the summer of 2013 mm -hmm. is where we started. Yeah, so at this time, the team was really a reduced size. We just came off a, a canceled project. Everybody had a lot of things to prove at that point. And we just had this opportunity to come up with new ideas, so everybody's really fired up. Yeah, and the, the studio had given us, our, internally we're known as Team 4, and the studio had given us six weeks to come up with some game ideas, and if one of the game ideas was cool enough, they'd put it into production. So as a team, we sort of, we looked at the six weeks and we, and we decided how do we want to spend it, and at first, you know, we thought, well, let's just start coming up with ideas and see where we get. But we knew that we would fall in love with the first idea we came up with. So we came up with this plan that we were going to take two weeks apiece and come up with three totally different game ideas and force ourselves at the end of the two weeks to move on to a different game idea each time. So we, we decided to start from a place that we were very inspired by and uh, something we, we very much loved. And we started working on a StarCraft idea. The, the thing about StarCraft and working at Blizzard, Blizzard has so many great games that when you're on one team, you just look at the stuff that people are doing on other teams, like World of Warcraft and StarCraft, and you just want to work on those, those universes. So it was a huge opportunity for us to you know, dive deep into the StarCraft universe. And we wanted to tell stories that you might not be able to tell with an RTS. We wanted to you know, explore the world um, what the civilians were like, what the people like down on the ground on these planets were like. Uh, this is an image that we did really early on in the project to, to kind of pitch this idea. And it's actually based off a really old Chris Metzen sketch way back in the StarCraft 1 days. Uh, I think it was a, a prospector image that he, he drew. It was one of my personal favorite ones. And we kind of wanted to bring that vibe into this, uh, this, new, this new game idea that we were doing. Yeah, and um, Arnold, that picture looks super familiar. Yeah, well, like, e even though this project didn't come to fruition, um, the, the hero eventually made it, was a huge inspiration for a hero in Overwatch. Yeah, so uh, yeah, event eventually became Winston. Yeah, Winston, as everyone knows. So, um, <laughs> as you guys know. But uh, what was cool, like, like Arnold was saying, the, we took a lot of inspiration actually from Warcraft 3 and World of Warcraft on the StarCraft project we were working on. And when we first started working on World of Warcraft, we said, we need to show a different perspective of the Warcraft universe. We don't want to make an MMO where everybody is just like the Stormwind Guard, like you're the footman from, from the Alliance um, from Warcraft 3. We really want to show you what it's like, who the individuals and the people are in this world. So that's why the StarCraft idea was really compelling, that you saw a different side of the universe than the large army uh, big war. So we had so much fun working on this. The guys from the StarCraft team were coming over, guys like Sam Didier, and just totally firing us up. And I think at the end of yeah. the two weeks, nobody wanted to move on. We yeah. all just wanted to make the StarCraft we, game. We had this complete pitch deck. We had like all these different mock-ups for screenshots and like armor sets and all that stuff. It was super fun to work on. Yeah, it almost felt like like, OK, now we're just going to phone it in for two more ideas yeah, that, that, and like, get back to one. the StarCraft idea. Yeah. But uh, oddly enough, right after that, we switched onto a brand new project. And uh, this time, we decided to explore a brand new intellectual property and a new universe that Blizzard had never done before. And it really was a Chris Metzen idea that we were super excited about. 
and Chris does such a better job than, than I do of, of telling this, but basically the idea is that there was this far remote outpost planet in the universe where it was sort of like the crossroads of the universe and all different alien races would end up on the same planet and we thought it'd be a really cool setting for a video game. Yeah, I remember like coming up with all these different ideas for art style because you don't get a lot of opportunities to work on a new IP at, at Blizzard and we were just, you know, the, the gears were spinning and there were so many things we wanted to do. And one of the things about working with Bill Petrus, our art director, is that whenever he creates a piece of art, and he was the original art director on World of Warcraft, um, it's such a treat because it just sets the vision so clearly. Uh, so we want to show a piece of art that he did for this new project. And he's usually a super busy guy, and he doesn't usually get a lot of time to do art. But I think even seeing him like being so fired up and doing like three pieces of art in, in, in the span of like two days really inspired us to want to work on this new project. So uh, Bill was doing a ton of art, and we were starting to get really fired up about what this brand new world could be. Um, and it was absolutely beautiful, and it was very inspiring. We were also pulling a lot of reference art uh, from you know, games, movies, deviant art, places that just inspired us of you know, what sort of things could we use as our muse or our inspiration. And during that time, you know, there's kind of like three elements to exploring a new game idea. That, that we were looking at. One was defining the visual style, so doing things like uh, Bill's you know, concept art that you're seeing right now. The other part was all of our engineers were exploring what technology would be needed to make a game like this work, because we had certain you know, demands, like how many players do you need to be in an area, and how instanced or non-instanced is something, um, how much persistence is there in the game, meaning if you get an item, does it exist you know, three months later, and that sort of thing. So our engineers were doing a lot of tech research. And then um, there's a lot of game design that has to happen during a phase like this as well. And the game that we were talking about making in this sort of crossroads of the universe type game that we were exploring was an MMO. And it was going to be class-based. And we were exploring somewhere between six and nine classes for the game. And we had a class meeting where our class designer is a gentleman by the name of Jeff Goodman. You might know him from his work on World of Warcraft and his work on Overwatch. Um, Jeff had also been the class designer for Titan. And I remember in the class meeting, Jeff Goodman said something that just really has stuck with me uh, forever. And he said in, in that class meeting, he said, I wish instead of doing a game with six or maybe nine classes, we could do a game with 50 classes. But I wish each of the classes was very focused and had a, a certain set of abilities, and they could all be wildly different from one another. He's like, that would be a game that I think we could make and that would be so compelling. So Jeff, you know, Jeff says that in the meeting, and we're like, you know, we kind of go back to our, our, our desks, and you know, you're thinking for an MMO, if it's going to have X number of levels, and if, if you're leveling up and you need gear, like, there's no way we can make 50 classes. That, that's, uh, that's, it's tough for World of Warcraft to get to the number of classes it is right now at you yeah. know, 12 years in. So, um, but, it, but it really stuck with me, because I, I'm like, that's an awesome vision. And at the same time, we were in this like post-mortem wake period of losing Titan, this game that we were in love with and we had poured you know, our hearts and souls into. And one of the things that was the most awesome about Titan was all of the incredible art that was being done for the project. Um, I always tease that like, if we wanted to come out with an art book for Titan, we probably could come out with six. Yeah, like, there's a lot of... Just volumes. Like, yeah. it, there was a lot of art done for that project. But if you, if you guys want to see some of there's there's actually some in the Art of Overwatch book, the Overwatch art book. Um, so if you guys haven't checked that out yet, there's actually a lot of stuff like for in, when you see the tracer section um, from, from those early days. Yeah. And this guy, Arnold, had done a ton of the art. And one of the things that really inspired me was his character art. Um, because not only were we doing art design on the character classes, we were also doing art design for lots of the bad guys in the, in the world of Titan. Um, you know, we had a group called the Junkers, uh -huh. you know, and they had this guy with a big hook that would throw out and had a pig a face. A mask and a big you belly. Know? So there was all these really cool characters. So I went back to my desk, and we were supposed to be working on Crossworlds, and I started 
this little tiny, it was an eight page PowerPoint of a totally different game. And this was one of the slides from that game. <laughs> and um, I basically took like Arnold's amazing art and Jeff's sort of concept of like, what if there were just dozens and dozens of characters and put it together um, in this little eight page pitch. And then this was one of the slides that came out of that. Yeah, it, it's crazy. When you work on a project for such a long time and it gets canceled, you kind of want to move on. You don't really want to see any of the art that you did. You're like, ah, I, I, I want to move on and do something new. We wanted to try, like, hey, let's try some stuff for StarCraft. Let's try a totally new idea that has nothing to do with you know, the project that we worked on. So at the time, I was like, OK, whatever we do, is, as long as it doesn't have to do with anything to do with what we worked on. But then as soon as you pitch the idea, like, oh, instead of classes, it's characters with backstories. Like, instead of the jumper, we're like, oh, what if, what if this character had a name? Tracer. And what if she had a backstory? She's from the UK. She used to be a test pilot for this group called Overwatch. It started to get really, really interesting for us as artists and as character designers, just because working on MMOs, I, wor I worked on a couple MMOs. And the thing about working on MMOs is like, you work on armor sets. You work on characters that you know, players really attach to as their own personal characters. But as storytellers, you really want to tell more stories about the characters that you put in your universe. And suddenly, this new idea just opened that wide open. And it was like, OK, now, now remember that, that dude, the, the Reaper? Let's give him a totally fleshed out backstory and how he was involved with Overwatch. And suddenly, all these ideas started to, to spring out. And it just really, really inspired the team to, to, to make this game. Yeah. And so we're supposed to be working on this Crossroads of the Universe idea. And we're only like maybe four or five days into it. We and never got to the final pitch that no, we we're didn't, like. We, we didn't make it all the way. And like, Ray Gresco, who was our production director at the time uh, and is now our executive producer, he came and he looked over my shoulder and he's like, oh, so are you guys working on that MMO idea? Is that what that, that deck is that, that you've got up on your screen? I'm like, no, actually, Ray, this is a, a different idea. Let, let me show it to you real quick. And it was super brief because it was only eight slides. And Ray just immediately turns to me and says, that's what we should be doing instead you need to pitch this to the team and see how they feel about it. And then so we took it to Metzen right after that. And it was, this all like transpired in over like 30 minutes, pretty much. Then uh, Ray and I took the deck to Chris's desk and then showed Chris and said, you know, imagine that these were heroes and characters um, and not just classes. Um, and we could make this like awesome uh, action shooter game. And Chris had the same reaction as Ray, like, why are we wasting our yeah. time on these other game ideas? We just should make that. That is exactly what we should, should make. So um, we went to the team the next morning, and we showed the team. And they universally fell in love with the idea, so much so that we, we did this like little assignment after we finished the pitch, where we said, hey, if you guys are super into this idea, go back to your desk and throw a hero idea together that you think would be cool, like a design, and pull some art from the Titan file, and see what you come up with. And they came up with 48 hero ideas, like in, in a morning. Yeah, I still remember the idea I came up with. It, it didn't make it into the game, but it was like so fun just to think of all these different, different abilities and like different weapons that we could you know, put, stick to one, some of these concepts that we did. The, the story I love that you tell them, Alex Afrasiabi, who is the creative director on World of Warcraft, was actually part of the Overwatch Inception group. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't you describe what his hero was that he pitched uh, that day? What was that? I, I think that was like... I, it was Russian? You want me to tell a yeah, story? Yeah. Okay. So... <laughs> I think... Yeah. Okay. You can tell a story. Tell it a story. was a Russian uh, female oh. who rode a bear. She rode on a bear, and she dual-wielded AKs, like AK-47s. Yeah. And then, do you remember what the ultimate was? The ultimate was the bear would pull out... The bear also, also pulled, pulled out, out AKs. AKs. That's a very Alex Afrasiabi <laughs> idea right there. So hopefully you guys can help me in this too. Convince him to come work with us on Overwatch. We would, we would <laughs> love to have Alex's ideas. Um, so anyway, this is literally the slide from that like super ghetto pitch deck I did. And this is like what we call designer art. Like I just pull Arnold art. I'm using the default PowerPoint <laughs> template there. Uh, you can see Spec Ops, you know, his main ability was stealth. So, yeah, so you don't need art Yeah, he looks fine. Um, but, <laughs> But then like, the process we had to go into after that was we had to convince the Blizzard 
executives, and we had to convince the Activision executives to make the game. So then we made a much more polished pitch deck, and we started getting way more serious about pitching the game. So we have this amazing game designer on the, on the team named Jeremy Craig, and he put together this slide to really sell the idea of a hero game. So this is going to make the internet explode, this slide right the, here. This is one of my favorite slides. And if, if you're pitching a game idea, you want Jeremy Craig to make your pitch deck yeah. because he makes it look so good. And he was able to take all of these characters. And these were some of these were player classes from Titan. Some of these were NPCs. Some of them were just random ideation drawings that we did. Like Mama Hong is one of my favorite I ones. I think the there. only like original for Overwatch design was Winston. Yeah, I think Winston. everything else sort of came from uh, yeah. from Titan. Totally. Um, so it was it was super inspiring. And whenever we would show this slide, we would, we would be pitching the game to like game directors at Blizzard and production directors, and you know we were pitching the game to Mike and Frank, and it was so awesome because everybody immediately was drawn to different heroes. You know, oh Luke, that's such a cool idea. That's one of be, my favorite ones. I want to be Luke someday, and um, I think Mama Hong was probably the the one that um, I personally hope makes it into Overwatch someday. Um, and she's been very controversial, but you can see other ones like Angelica went on to become Mercy. Yeah. Um, and then we had, uh, you know, there you can see Symmetra and Torbjorn are all yep. mixed in there as well. You, you can't really tell from the design, but Longshot ended up being uh, Widowmaker. Um, yeah, there's just so many cool ideas here. Every time I look at it, I, I, I notice a new one. So we're also pitching this idea of like a global game that took place at all these cool places on Earth. And um, we, were, we were saying, you know, hey, roughly at, at launch, we would probably have around 12 maps. So we took a lot of concept art from Titan. And, and as you can tell, I mean, some of you guys are, are more on the art side than others. But those of you who, who are artists can really recognize the difference between this art style and the Overwatch art style. And you could probably yeah, talk best to it. This is some beautiful art from Peter Lee, one of our concept artists. And he really did all, he did a, a ton of beautiful paintings for, for Project Titan. And for Project Titan, we had we, idea of having all these different locations in different worlds. But the art, you'll notice the art style is a little different. And I think once we started working on the characters for Overwatch, uh, we took these, the inspiration from these locations and really spun the, the art style onto it. Uh, I remember Bill Petras, our art director, along with Ben Jang, our senior concept artist, really kind of putting pushing the color, pushing the, the silhouette, and just getting really that, that vibrance of the Overwatch universe uh, in, into, the, into the world. Yeah, and you can even see like the World of Warcraft inspiration. Yeah, there. yeah. So um, the, the whole Blizzard team um, was amazingly inspired and supportive of this idea. You know, we show this game to Mike Morheim, who's our CEO, and Frank Pierce, who's one of the founders of Blizzard, and, and he's in charge of all of game development. And they were just like, go, this is awesome. Um, we think your team can do a really good job of this. And then the, the next big step was uh, pitching the game to Activision. So Blizzard is, uh, we are a merged company with Activision Blizzard. So we want to make sure our Activision partners are on board with the idea. So we go into a meeting where we have to pitch this new game, game concept to the top executives at Activision. It was, it was kind of a very daunting experience because you have to remember six weeks earlier, we were the team that was responsible for um, getting one of the, <laughs> the biggest investments canceled in probably company history, maybe video game history. I don't, I don't really know. So you're walking in this room and you're like, are these guys, are they still holding on to that? Are they a little angry at us? Um, and, and we're going through the pitch deck, and, and in hindsight, and I feel really naive saying this, but in hindsight, I, you know, we should have thought of this ahead of time. We walk into the room, and here is Activision, this company that makes Call of Duty, which is one of the greatest, most successful shooters of all time. And then we're the team that just got a project canceled and failed making it, which was going to be a shooter. And we walk in, and we sit down at the table, and we're like, OK, we have this new idea to pitch for you, just what Activision really wants right now, a shooter. A shooter. <laughs> and like in hindsight, I should have known walking, like, like that probably wasn't <laughs> super wise. And to the Activision executives credit, they were so good. Like they didn't, they were supportive and they, they didn't, 
maybe I'm projecting, but I had this feeling of like when you kind of look at mom and dad and they're just doing the, oh, like, what are you guys You're doing? You're like, huh? huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, and, then, and then the pitch was going on. And what was funny is like when we pitched it to the Blizzard executives, like they were super interactive and they were talking to us through the whole pitch and asking questions. And um, it was very interactive. And then the Activision pitch, it was very quiet the whole time. It was, there was like a, a, there was a, it was almost like you were in this like vacuum chamber in the, in the room. And then we, I, I'm going through the slides and I'm trying to really sell them that this is going to be an awesome idea. And Bobby Kotick, who's the CEO of Activision, stops me like dead mid presentation. Like he's like, just, just stop, go back three slides. And instantly in my head, I'm thinking, oh no, what was three slides ago? Um, because Bobby is just so sharp and like nothing is lost on him at all. And as part of when you, ha when you pitch a video game, um, you know, you also have to do like some market research and you're, you're also pitching some financial forecasts and that sort of thing. And I'm thinking like was maybe one of the financial forecasts was off or unrealistic that we had put in. And that was three slides ago. But the slide Bobby had me go back to was this slide. Um, I'm pointing there, but it's actually there. Um, it, was, it was this slide, and um, it was this picture that Arnold had drawn. And he stops at me, and he actually stood up, and he walks up to the screen, and he's just walking back and forth in front of the screen. And he said, I've never seen characters like this before, and I've never seen art this compelling. This art is amazing. This is going to be an amazing universe. And it, like, I think it, I, I was lucky to sort of be sandwiched between two okay. visionaries there. On the one hand, like Bobby could recognize what we had. And on the other hand, this guy, Arnold, uh, had, <laughs> had drawn this. So why don't you talk okay, about sure. why, why you drew it? I mean, the, the, the fundamental idea of it, it came from you know, jamming with guys like Jeremy Craig and, and Bill Petrus. And we wanted an image. We didn't have a lot of time to put this, this pitch together, and we wanted to, to make a new image, we had a lot of images you know, from, from Titan. But we want to create a new image that just sold the idea of the game. And we, we could have easily come up with you know, some really crazy action scenes with like Tracer and Reaper doing crazy abilities. But we felt like we wanted, really wanted to show what was unique about this universe. And there was something, something inspiring about Jeremy and Bill's idea of just lining up these characters, kind of like comic books or, you know, uh, you know, superheroes, that kind of, those kind of genres where you just let the, let, let the characters speak for themselves. And as soon as we did that, we realized we have a lot of variety here. And immediately, diversity and all, all this color became such an integral part of the Overwatch universe. And as soon as we saw this image lined up, it's like, maybe we don't even need a, a background. Let's just let the color kind of fly. Let the silhouettes really, you know, just dance around. And... I think what we ended up with uh, that really spoke to people was like the variety, the, the, the color, and just like the richness of this, this, what this universe had to promise. Yeah, so this picture not only did it inspire you know, everybody at, at Blizzard, everybody at Activision, but it really inspired the team. Um, and it was like a cornerstone. And you're probably wondering why it says Prometheus across the top. All Blizzard projects, before they get announced, have a code name. Um, so that way, when we're at BlizzCon and somebody's had a few too many drinks, you don't <laughs> find out about like, oh my god, they announced this new game at, at the bar at BlizzCon. Uh, instead, you accidentally say Prometheus, and then everybody, you know, <laughs> then they think we're working on a game named Prometheus, and we're going to get sued by that movie company. But, um, but that was just a code name. Yeah, it, it's, it's funny just to see some of these concepts, too, because like, from the deck, the deck slide that Jeff showed earlier with all the, the concepts to here, it kind of evolved a little bit. We took some of those ideas and we started to, to change them around. You can kind of see like what ended up being Roadhog in there and, and Widowmaker. It was actually Reinhardt is the big red guy. Yeah, the big red guy turned into Reinhardt yeah. and Torbjorn's claw he was, was Wildebeest. The wrong, Wildebeest. For, he was for a short period of time, Reinhardt was Wildebeest. Yeah, and really, we really wanted to get that. Like, he, he was like this African-inspired mech, mech suit, and, which was an idea that really stuck with us. And even though we didn't do it on Reinhardt, it still resonated, and we ended up doing something like that for Arista. Yeah, it you know, came it, into play. Yeah. Okay, so now the game, we, the game was not green lit, which what a green light means for a video game is that you're full-blown approved for production, like everybody's expecting the game to, to launch one day. 
the game was given permission to get to a green light gate. Um, and so I'm going to show you the timeline here. And there were two main things going on. One, and I'm going to go into more depth on this in a second, was we had to hit a milestone called core combat in March of 2014. And again, I'll talk about that in a second. And then the other thing going on at this time was something that we called the tech reboot. So as we mentioned, we were a team transitioning from a game called Titan, um, which was the project name. And we were moving on to this new action shooter that we wanted to make. Um, and uh, there's a lot of misconceptions that people have about Titan to Overwatch. I, I, I you know, read all the comments people say, and they say, well, Overwatch is just a scaled down version of Titan, or they just took the leftovers from Titan. But I, I really don't think that does the game justice. So we, we were making a brand new engine for Titan that did evolve into the Overwatch engine. But over 3 million lines of code had to be deleted from Titan in order to make Overwatch. And all that remained was about uh, 700,000 plus lines of code. Th that's about it. Um, we had to make a totally server authoritative architecture that we didn't have before. We had to move to a global illumination lighting system that we didn't have uh, previously before. And the, the thing that I think was, uh, we also went to physical-based rendering. But I think the thing that was most important on the technology shift was if we were going to be a world-class first-person shooter, the game had to run at 60 frames per second on PC, Xbox, and PlayStation 4. Yeah, and, and one of the things that I hear a lot too is like, oh, um, they just took all, all the art assets from Titan and you know, they put it in, into this game Overwatch. But actually, I mean, though we took a lot of the concepts and the ideas uh, from Titan, all the art from Overwatch was, was made from scratch. We've had to start all over again. You know, we had the Reaper in Titan, but we, re we re slightly redesigned him, and we modeled him from scratch. We modeled Torbjorn twice, I think. And everything from, for Overwatch was just made brand new. Yeah, there's zero models or textures or animation from Titan in, in Overwatch. Um, yeah, definitely concept art. So now this is a super fun part. I need your guys' trust in this moment. So we don't like to show works in progress. We're perfectionists. We like to be known for blizzard polish and things looking really nice and beautiful. We like to show you things like the Blizzard World trailer that we showed yesterday where everything looks awesome. You are now about to see what the game looks like when we're making it. And it's pretty ugly. Yeah, the art team is going to kill us. For yeah, sure. yeah. So um, this, we're going to show you a series of videos of what Overwatch looked like throughout the making. And the first one we're going to start with is uh, a tech reboot video of the technical work we're doing. So let's go ahead and ro roll that video. And I'm going to talk over what you're seeing. OK, so this is the first time we rendered anything in the engine. Uh, again, it was a proprietary engine made from scratch. This is Tracer in October 2013, her little Mickey Mouse hands. We were unable to put guns in her hands, so she had to shoot laser beams out of her eyes um, to simulate shooting. Uh, we had no visual effects. We were playing around with environmental lighting, as you can see. Um, this is the very first playtest of Overwatch, ran by our assistant game director, Aaron Keller. The point of this playtest was to make sure that the scale FOV camera height was correct. All we had was Tracer. You can see that Widowmaker looking Tracer over there, which is just uh, Tracer, Tracer with a Widowmaker skin. Um, this is our uh, physics programmer, Aaron Cotto, was getting the Blizzard physics engine working within the Overwatch engine for the first time. So you can have things like the, the uh, crates and vases on uh, Temple of Anubis breaking and moving. I mean, you saw recall for the first time. Tracer doesn't have any visual effects on her guns. And then there's little nuanced things that you don't think about having to work on. But like when you walk up and down stairs, how much does the camera bump or smooth through? So all very early footage of what was going on in the tech reboot, not super fun. We're not talking about things like balance or <laughs> anything like that at that point. We're just trying to put stuff on the screen and make it work. Yeah, and I think one of the, the most fun things whenever I watch that video is to see how Tracer's hands and her guns evolved from these like floating gloves to like something that was close to what was uh, almost the final model at the end of, the, of like a very short timeline. Yeah. Okay, so like I mentioned, the next big milestone was core combat 
in March of 2014. And what, what the goal was here was to prove that we had a game that was fun, that people could actually play. Um, we were going to sit people down from around Blizzard, other teams, and have them really believe in it being fun. So we, what we promised to deliver was one map. We were going to make the Temple of Anubis. At the time, it was just known as Cairo. That was the code name. <laughs> and we were going to have four heroes, which were going to be Tracer, Reaper, Widowmaker, and Reinhardt. Yeah, Reinhardt was actually going to be the, the fourth hero. And at this time, we had, a, you know, we had a lot of concepts, and we kept on we were continuing to concept more and more heroes. So Reinhardt was going to be the fourth hero, and we, wanted to, we had a, a version of him working in the game. But there was, uh, because he was our first melee-only hero, it came with a lot of difficulties um, of getting that feeling good for core combat. So what we did was uh, Jeff Goodman had a prototype of uh, Rocket Dude, Rocket Dude in the game. His name was just Rocket Dude. And he had a jetpack and a rocket launcher. But already, he was super fun to play and was a character that we could implement into the game and feel good you know, fighting with Tracer, Reaper, and Widowmaker. So we took that idea from, from the game design, and we, we spun up like many, many different rounds of iteration on Farah, and eventually she became Farah. Yep. So now we're going to talk over uh, core combat video, where you, where you see the game evolving even more at this point. Uh, so go ahead and roll that video, please. All right, so you can see early Temple of Anubis. Uh, Tracer doesn't have all our textures, but we're getting things like recall in there. Yeah, the Reaper's T-pose. We use, we use the Reaper for scale sometimes. Early on, we're still figuring out how, how to scale our buildings properly. Sometimes we forget to de delete the Yeah, reaper. so the, you just have Reapers like all over. <laughs> this is literally the first play, play test ever with Farah in it. The first day she was in, you can see how slow her rockets are you shooting. You can barely see it without the, the trail view. There's no there. visual effects there. Here's an early uh, animation prototype for Tracer. We're still getting the hang of you know, getting the third person. Her head is just bobbing wildly, which made headshots really hard. So um, we took a lot of iterations to get just, just the right amount of, of movement. All right, so we're moving along. And this is interesting because uh, we came back in January of 2014. And now the game was starting to be fun. I mean, granted, it was only Tracer versus Tracer. So all you No Limits fans would have loved it back then <laughs> um, and Tracer mains. But the game was actually fun. And you can kind of see Temple of Anubis is really taking shape now in terms of level design. We play the levels just blocked out in, in gray blocks like that. And then we were really proud. This is just 24 days later. You can see the progress that was made. And the whole time here, the UI is evolving. Uh -huh. The game mode is starting to work. Like We actually have capture points that you can stand on. Um, and uh, more and more is coming together. Early health uh, pack, early health as, pack. as silly as that looked. <laughs> um, you can see the Temple of Anubis was open. Now, here's Reapers in the game. Now, you're going to see the world's coolest Death Blossom animation is coming up right here. Greatest animation. Wait for it. There yeah. it is. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what the game looks like to us when we're, when we're making it. His muzzle um, flashers are these giant Farrah's balls. rocket launcher is making some progress, yep. but it, it's going to look different. We decided she's blue now. Like yeah. I remember that whole meeting at your desk for what color Farrah should be. We're getting uh, Widowmaker's grappling hook working. And then we're learning things like, hey, maybe you shouldn't be able to get up there in Temple of Anubis. Maybe that's not such a good place for Widowmaker. This is also, I'm sorry to admit, this is some of the worst sniping you're ever going to see. And this was me. <laughs> uh, and like somebody said, like, oh, at least you finished him off. I'm like, I didn't finish him off. Somebody else finished him off. I, I didn't even hit him. And then by February, we're like now getting really close to our March milestone. Yeah, the lighting is starting to come in here with our, like, all the stuff we were doing with the new engine. And it's just started looking so beautiful. Uh, Temple of Anubis started to come to life. And like the UI is evolving now. Uh -huh. You can see we're getting like a character portrait there, um, an ultimate. Wid Widowmaker's ultimate used to just put little marks above everybody's head because we couldn't yet render the silhouettes through the walls. That would come later. So that was core combat. That was all the work we were doing to like get people to the point where they could sit down and actually play the game and um, think it was fun. And they did. Yeah, and I, I still remember after core combat was, was complete, we, this was our moment to show um, this pro uh, project Prometheus to all of Blizzard, uh, the, the Blizzard family. And, I, and it's been, I think, not even a year at that point that you know, we came off a canceled project. And like I was saying earlier, we had so much to prove. We wanted to show everybody that you know, we, we're not failures. We can, we can make a game. We can make something fun. So you know, we had a, there was a company show and tell 
that you know every now and then we'll sh we'll show everybody else what we're working on. All the different teams kind of show their latest work, and nobody really I don't know if anybody expected no they didn't team, think we were to show anything. Yeah. And if they and if they did, maybe it was like a couple concepts. But we showed Core Combat, and everybody was super excited. And it, it was the first kind of validation for us as a team, as as you know people who re were really unsure of themselves after you know working so many years on a project that that got canceled. That it really invigorated us and you know pushed us to the next milestone. Yeah, and the, and the next part is amazing because there's there's a guy a lot of you guys don't know about. His name is Ray Gresco, and Ray is really the leader of the Overwatch team. And Overwatch would not exist without Ray. And throughout the whole you know shutting down of Titan to starting of Overwatch, Ray was that guy that just you know steered the ship the whole way. And Ray came out of. Um, the Titan reboot, and he said, uh, once he saw Overwatch, he said, we are going to announce that game at BlizzCon next year. We are going to become a, a Blizzard story for Blizzard developers far in the future that we were the game that got canceled one year and announced at Blizz BlizzCon the next year. Um, and it was through Ray's inspiration, leadership, and belief that we could actually do it that he literally put the team on the track that like, we're doing it, BlizzCon 2014, um, we need to announce the game. So we, we quickly started to think about, well, what does it take to announce a, a game at, at Blizzard? And we felt really strongly that when we came here to BlizzCon and we were gonna announce the game, we didn't wanna be one of those games that just gave you like a little teaser trailer or like, yeah. here's a fuzzy version of the logo, like Overwatch, figure what it out. It? Yeah. Yeah. Like, maybe, you know, like, <laughs> we wanted soon. to be here. And so our goal was, as a team, we came up with, we're going to have three playable maps and 12 playable heroes on the show floor so they can play it all weekend, so they can decide if it's cool or not, rather than, like, we're all going to argue over the fuzzy logo if that's <laughs> cool or not. Um, so we, we moved into um, our BlizzCon milestone. And we're going to show a movie right now of uh, getting all of those uh, 12 heroes uh, together. Oh, actually, I take that back. Um, in, in the effort to get all those 12 heroes together, um, there was so much work. And I think sometimes people don't realize how much work goes into one hero. So we wanted to do a breakdown first of like, let's look at just Hanzo coming together. Yeah. And then you can extrapolate that to how, how many heroes that we were involved in. So, we're going to start with, uh, with Hanzo right here. You're going to see the earliest versions of Hanzo in this video. Check it out. So a designer by the name of Mike Heiberg was the guy who implemented Hanzo. Um, and the first thing we just worried about was getting the bow to feel good. Then we worked on things like Sonic Arrow. So he's hiding Widowmaker right there. And we're throwing the Sonic Arrow. And again, we can't render the silhouettes through the walls just yet. And, and then everybody's, everybody's favorite ability, Scatter Arrow, being worked on right here. Um, and back then it was just called ricochet shot, but getting the physics to work. And then we were working on this ability called Dragon Strike that was going to be a moving area of effect that does damage. And so for us to do that, we rendered these spheres. Mike Heiberg rendered these spheres, and it quickly became known as the Caterpillar. Um, and you can see it. There it is. The googly and, eyes. And he put, so he put googly eyes on it on the other side. Uh, so that was Dragon Strike. And then it wasn't even animated for a while. You'll see now we yeah, have the, a dragon. Yeah, so this version is just moving in space. Um, and here's an early animation test by our animator, Jesse Davis. And we were, at this point, we were like, this is really cool, but it's so different from the, the big caterpillar. It doesn't fill that same hitbox. You it couldn't like, tell if you were in it or Yeah, not. like, could you dodge it if you know, it just moves the right way? So in some meeting, we kind of drew this on the whiteboard. Like, what if there was two dragons you know, spiraling? spiraling. And you know that this, so this is an early concept kind of based on that idea of how these dragons would kind of burst from this portal and kind of spiral around and just that idea to fill, that would help fill that hitbox that you know Mike Heiberg was thinking of so this is the final version that we showed at BlizzCon yeah so you can see just like the evolution that even a single ability takes in a game like it's, it's there's a long iterative process um, but it's a lot of fun um, we have a lot of fun doing it yeah, another thing that we did a lot during this time was we were, so we knew the heroes that we wanted to make for, for BlizzCon, but at the same time, we were developing all these different ideas for new heroes, trying to find our boundaries for this new universe. So at this time, we had Winston, 
And we knew that in the Overwatch universe, there is a talking, intelligent gorilla from the moon. That exists. So how, how much further could we go? We really wanted to see how, how far we could stretch this universe. So we tried things like, see on the, on the left side, there's like this little thin alien dude. There's a dude in like full bomb suit armor that you can't even see his head, and you don't know if it's a, a robot or, a, or an alien. And then the best. Jeff's favorite, as a big hockey fan. <laughs> And uh, th we had, we had then, uh, like crazy ideas like this hockey hero. He had like jets on his, on his, uh, on his legs. And I don't, is he even playing hockey properly? I don't know who holds a stick like that. That's like curling pose or something. But I like the idea of the hockey hero, but we've got to work <laughs> on that pose. So we're trying so many different things. I still remember one of the other uh, the game designs that Jeff Goodman had was this uh, flying character with a flamethrower. So not flying in the sense of Farah, but almost like free flight, I yeah, think it was. Yeah, free flight. And so we, thought, we felt some of those ideas from the last page were a little too crazy. So we're like, hey, let's bring it back. We have Winston. Let's take a smaller step. Let's do a monkey. So we did this. We put a jetpack on a monkey, gave him a flamethrower. We're like, how does that feel? <laughs> <laughs> Feels dangerous. It's, yeah. yeah. So we, you know, we iterated a few more. We tried a robot monkey. We tried a crocodile. We tried all these different things. There's a creepy kid with a flaming goatee and gargoyle. Gargoyle in there. But what this ultimately culminated in was everybody's favorite concept, a jetpack cat. <laughs> this is one of my favorites because it taught us a lot of lessons, but it's also uh, one of the most popular concepts on the team as well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I always like the one on uh, I like the one on the right more because it feels like an actual cat. Like the actual cat would just be, you know, yeah, yeah, on the laying there on his yeah, just, super paw, lazy. just lazily at it. Yeah, so we we kind of felt like we w we had done all this exploration and these were really awesome ideas, but we we felt like we were slipping out of the universe. And I think where we left it was like this these might be great ideas for another game at some point, but yeah. this is not Overwatch at this point. Um, so it was fun. Um, now, there was other things going on on the design side, similar to the art side, where we were doing all this ideation in terms of how far could we push the heroes. We were also, also exploring all sorts of crazy game designs. So um, we're going to share with you one of Torbjorn's earliest abilities that never saw the light of day, thank God, um, <laughs> called the Claw Trap. So uh, originally, before he had armor pack, Torbjorn had the Claw Trap. Um, what he would do is he would go out and he would put the claw trap out. He could put it on the ground, on a wall, on the ceiling, and it was kind of like a, a mine, like almost like Widowmaker's mine. And then if, a, if another hero on the enemy team walked past the claw trap, it would shoot out this chain and grab the hero and then contain them to that area. Yeah, so here's a concept of the claw trap. You'll see it in the, in the game. It's just block out art and... I think he throws it out, and it's a widow mine. But when it attaches, it's like this tiny Torbjorn turret. Yeah, see. something like that. But um, another thing to pay attention uh, when we show you the video is Reinhardt has an ability that he doesn't actually have in the in the final game. Uh, see if you can pick, pick out which one that is. Okay, so let's let's take a look at the claw trap video now. All right, so step one, throw it out. Step two, deploy. Step three, all terror breaks loose. Because, <laughs> of course, Torb's going to throw it in front of the And here's early animations on Torbjorn. Like, it looks pretty ghetto. Um, and then Torb trying to find just that perfect spot, Temple of Anubis choke in the early days. And now watch what happens as our heroes come through. Oh, there's Reinhardt throwing his hammer. Uh, Ryan didn't make it. Maybe Tracer can make it through. Nope. She's not getting through. Maybe Widowmaker. She's clawed and she's done. So you just put the claw in front. Watch now. Reinhardt can think maybe Charge will get me past the claw trap. No. no. Oh, poor Reinhardt. I like he's just like deer in the headlights. He doesn't even try <laughs> to swing or anything. Um, ironically, when when Reinhardt got that hammer throw ability, it was because of the the claw trap. Because what would happen is Reinhardt kept getting stuck in the claw trap and then had nothing to do yeah. and no way to kill the claw trap. So we gave him the hammer throw. Um, then we had the hammer throw on Reinhardt and we had this weird moment where Reinhardt would throw his hammer really far and then he wouldn't have the yeah. ability to swing at anybody. He'd be like, uh, guys, I'm <laughs> waiting for my hammer to come back. And then that's how Firestrike evolved over time. So 
All of this was going on at the same time. Eventually, it all culminated um, in what was to become our BlizzCon announce at 2014. And at the same time, we're also working on the animated short to announce the game. So there was so much work going on. Um, and then you'll even see some things, uh, you'll even see some things towards the end of the video that weren't in our BlizzCon announce that had to do with future heroes that were coming down the line because we had to be working on those in anticipation of, you know, hey, like we announced the game, but we're not done making heroes yet. So let's take a look at the BlizzCon video and you're gonna see tons of early work in progress. Um, going on that took us on that road to BlizzCon. So this was, I think, literally the first Mercy gameplay that you're ever going to see. Early Reinhardt with his shield. Um, Mercy got rezzed. You'll notice early on, Mercy's healing was green instead of yellow. And we're, we're kind of mixing the colors. And we really needed to decide, to decide what healing color would be. Would it be yellow or green? And I think we saved green for poison eventually. Yep. And then King's Row looked like, uh, you know, all block out. This is early uh, Robot City in King's Row, the, the final point. You can see how open it used to be. Um, we had a couple problems there. One was sight lines, and then the other was people like me falling in the pit like idiots. <laughs> um, Ragdoll so, physics. So that happened a lot. Early Reinhardt Reinhard charge. charge. Poor Torbjorn. You used to have no startup time. You'd press the button and you'd instantly. Yeah, you'll see him run too, I think, right yeah, here. Yeah. There it is. <laughs> it looks awesome. <laughs> Show it at BlizzCon. And then we didn't have a payload, so we had this truck. And then we didn't have art for the icon, so we used the doge. He's there. You just Maybe if we switch back to that icon, people would actually yeah, hey, know, what's that? be attracted yeah. to it in some way. Um, so you can see. Uh, and then we, like, we're doing all this stuff of like, making the Reinhardt hammer feel good. Yeah. Uh, here's some early uh, technology we we're trying to get for Mercy's ribbon to work. And interestingly, one of her alts back then was to actually heal multiple people. Yeah, heal multiple which kinda, people. It kind of comes, comes full, full circle. circle. Yeah. <laughs> the payload's evolving. You can see all the iterations yeah. of Reinhardt's shield in these yeah, early ones. Yeah, this is before ones. we had like, the, the nice shader for Reinhardt's shield. This is actually Winston. It might, you might think you're looking at a ferret. This is the first Winston playtest. So his um, leap ability used to be like Doomfist's um, alternate uh, leap ability. And then he didn't have animation, so he just ran around like a dude. <laughs> you can see him, just Winston, just running around. Yeah, um, if you notice the targeting thing, the, in, in the, right in the middle, there's like a banana. Yeah, see yeah. the banana right there? <laughs> um, so that was Winston's, uh, and he would just run around. He got killed by Tim right there. Awesome death pose. I, one of my favorite clips is coming up right here. So this is actually Volskaya Industries. We've talked about this before, where we prototype different map types. So Aaron Keller, our assistant game director, had this idea of what if we had a giant capture point that you could play on that was also a payload moving through the map. So we were doing all sorts of iteration on new game modes at this time, too. Ultimately, this idea failed because of the space required to move something as big as a capture point through it um, required uh, sight lines that were untenable. Uh, this is the earliest version of Hanamura that you're seeing in, in very early blockout. Tracer's facing like where the arcade would be right now. And then I love the hero select. Yeah. You can see what hero select looked like back early in the day. Load, early load screen for Temple of Anubis. Game. Oh, oh man, Winston. this is like the... Cool guy, Hanzo. Those are actually Reaper's animations Reaper's on, on, on Hanzo. Old Widowmaker Old face. Widowmaker face. This pose. <laughs> My favorite's Mercy. Mercy's coming up. She's angry. She's like, you're going to nerf me in 2017. <laughs> I'm, and I'm angry. I'm not... Too soon. Too soon. We're moving on. Um, <laughs> The, that, that bus in uh, King's Row went through so many iterations just to get the right shape. Oh, Bastion, yeah. his first day in the game. Perfect. He's got a tracer trail <laughs> on him for some reason. It turns out transforming robot was hard. Um, <laughs> so early Hanamura, this is, this is kind of exciting because this shows point B of Hanamura. And on point B, uh, it used to be a totally different design. It was this circular design. Um, and the, the waypoint said Temple because we were just using tech from Temple of Anubis at the time. Later, Aaron Keller would go back and completely redesign that whole point. But you can really see point A um, is starting to look exactly like it looks today. It's very similar in Hanamori. You've got Torbjorn. He used to have a mechanic where he had to place the stub of a turret first and then build it up eventually to get the turret to be able to shoot. 
Nowadays, when he places the turret, it can shoot right away without him even hammering on it. Yeah, you can see the Reinhardt, uh, the shield effects coming in there. Uh, here comes the hot tub, we used to oh, call it. Oh, the hot it. tub. The hot tub. Um, the victory pose in the hot <laughs> tub. Um, so that's actually the origin point of the map, and we didn't have the victory point or the victory pose point place. This was Symmetra's early playtest. Oh, super ghetto temp art for Symmetra's. Yeah, they're little Torbjorn turrets that she's placing on the walls, um, and then we had her teleporter working. Um, I love this clip right here because okay, Winston is going to kill the teleporter, and then watch Hanzo. <laughs> like, not my problem. <laughs> Don't worry. Sorry, Symmetra. That was Bastion's, one of his early ults was a, a volley of uh, bouncing grenades. Oh, there's uh, Reinhardt's shield starting yeah. to, the, the shader's starting to get there. The worst Reinhardt charge ever, besides the one in the cinematic. <laughs> um, yeah, there's an early uh, animation prototype for Bastion, back when he still had that shield in front yeah, of him. Yeah, he had the shield, and then he gets a little broken in some ways. And then Winston's early leap prototype, where he used to pound the ground with his fists. They used to do damage and stun you if you were in that range. Yeah, it was a long stun, too. It was a lot of damage and a long stun, so that had to go away. And then, like I said, characters that weren't going to be at BlizzCon, like McCree, we were having these moments where we were just getting McCree and Roadhog in the game. So yeah. you'll see these are uh, the first moments that we got the blockout art for uh, Roadhog and McCree in. And then uh, a fan favorite is Genji. This is early Genji prototype on Gibraltar when he only had the Dragon Blade and he could perch, like you're seeing him do here, and then run around and murder everybody. So when people thought it was a nerf going from eight seconds to six seconds on the ult, imagine it forever. <laughs> forever Dragon Blade is what Genji started out as. So this is the final hero select that we uh, ended up having at BlizzCon. Yeah, and we were, super, uh, we were super happy and super proud at this moment that you know, we had completed all these characters. And that moment when Chris Metzen walked out on the stage was, um, I think, one of the most emotional moments for most of us on the Overwatch team totally. in our lives. Yeah, that was definitely like the highlight of my, my career personally. And just being out there, like where, where you guys are sitting right now is where the Overwatch team was. We're just waiting for Chris to come out and announce the game, and everybody was just so nervous. At, it, it's kind of like this thing you've been working on for so many years, you don't know how everyone's gonna receive it. And Chris comes out, he shows the cinematic, I look to my left and my right, and everybody's just like, the faces are all wet, and I'm like, Ugh. It was just <laughs> such an emotional moment for all of us. And I think you were backstage, right? I was backstage, I was watching Chris walk out and watching his nervous energy, and then, um, it was, my heart has never pounded so fast. And we're just wondering the whole time, like, are they gonna like it? Yeah. Like, I hope they like it. Um, and then there was a really cool moment where everybody from the Overwatch team um, at that BlizzCon uh, got together and got, got together for a picture uh, during BlizzCon. And this is one of my favorite pictures of the Overwatch team because it's at that BlizzCon right after the announcement had yeah. happened. And just the journey that, our, that these guys had gone on um, was so special, and I was just so proud of the team and everything that they accomplished in that, in that moment. Yeah, I love the note there. It says, stuff in Aaron's eye. Yeah, oh, Aaron loves us to talk. He's, he's like, why do you have to show that picture? I got my finger in my eye. So sorry, Aaron. Um, anyway, I don't know if we have time for Q&A. Somebody will tell us if we have time or not. Um, but we really appreciate you guys listening to our long, rambling story of how Overwatch got made. We know it's a different flavor of a BlizzCon panel that we, than we usually do, but we thought it'd be super fun with, uh, to share with you some of the things that we, we went through in, in making the game. So thank you guys very much. Yeah. We will have a few minutes for questions. Oh, okay, awesome. We, it looks like we can take some questions. Hey guys. This is my fifth BlizzCon here, and this was by far the best, most informative, awesome panel of all five years I've ever. Oh, thank oh, you. Seriously, yeah. thank you. That's so thank awesome you for to showing hear. this. We had so much fun doing this. Yeah. Um, will we ever see any kind of uh, video in work progress of Titan similar to what we saw of Overwatch today? So I'm a no notorious. I call it a digital pack rat. And I take screenshots and videos of everything that we've ever worked on, you know, dating back to the earliest World of Warcraft days. I have like probably 50 gigs of video of Titan Post it. And, and screenshots. 
I think Please. we're letting the healing process happen yeah. for a while more, but I think someday uh, it'd be cool to, to talk about Titan, what, what, what went right and what went wrong. So it's possible someday you will start to see some of that stuff. I smell a documentary. In <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Hi. So I know I, I really like the Officer Diva skin, and I think she really needs a partner. Have you ever considered doing Officer May, since she already has the perfect voice line for it? That's a great idea. I think, yeah, that's uh, Officer May. Hell yeah. You're asking the skin guru, so <laughs> no. like you're, you're Make it heavily influential right yeah, now. We're very inspired by all the ideas that we, the skin ideas that like the fan art and this, the stuff you guys come up with in the community. So. Uh, Officer May, it's awesome. Sounds cool. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Hi there. You were mentioning how Overwatch was so character driven, and there are folks like me who are super lore thirsty and we love all the story hints. Is there any chance that we'll get novels fleshing out more of the world like we have for Warcraft, Starcraft, and Diablo? Well, we. I think uh, something that we've shown over the years since, since we've been talking about Overwatch is that we like exploring different uh, mediums. So um, I think actually the, like, the Doomfist reveal was a great example where we, where we made that um, the 2D animation that you had never sort of seen from us before. We're super uh, interested in exploring all sorts of different ways of telling Overwatch stories. Um, we've obviously we've done short fiction, we've done animated shorts, we've done anime, we've done comics. Um, we would love to do some form of long form fiction. So for us, just figuring out what that is um, is super compelling to us. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, thank you. What's up, guys? I'm hey. a huge Overwatch fan. Hey, good to see you. <laughs> Um, so I love Overwatch, huge fan of the art style, but I have kind of a gameplay question. So in the uh, Hanzo Genji uh, short, you can see how Hanzo can almost bend the path of arrows as they're traveling towards his target. And I was wondering if that was ever a gameplay consideration. And I mean, you did show some of his early iterations, but I was just wondering if bending arrows like that that the player could control was something ever on the board for him. I think that's a super awesome idea. I think um, deflect on Genji is as close as we've gotten to that. Um, I know a lot of players would be able to skillfully do something like, like that, like actually like bend the direction of a yeah. projectile. And our tech can certainly do that, which is cool. Um, so I think it's an awesome idea. It's something for us to explore. You know, whether we explore something like that on Genji or a future character, it's just a, it's just a rad idea. Yeah, Sweet. I think the great thing about the cinematics is they always show, they can show the characters do things that they don't do in the game. Uh, like, you know, Hanzo, you know, curving his arrow. I think we saw him do that also in the, the Hanzo and Alex Straza uh, Heroes mm -hmm. of the Storm piece, which was yep. super cool just to see him do different things there too. So yeah, we're constantly inspired by the things that the, the Blizzard animation team does. So a, a lot of ability ideas kind of cross-pollinate that way. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks. Hello. Hello. That's an awesome cosplay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, where do you go from here? Like, do you guys have a limit of like, we've made an amazing game, we have this amazing story. Do you have a cap, or are you just going as far as you can with what you have? Well, we know we're only as good as our last patch. And we have to earn it every single patch, every single day. Mm -hmm. And the team is so inspired to work on this universe, largely driven by you guys. Uh, the amount of community feedback and community inspiration we get is amazing. And there's no shortage of ideas. Um, we, could, we could sit and do a full BlizzCon, like 48 hours on here are ideas we would like to do with Overwatch that spans everything from lore to esports to new heroes to new maps. It's just a matter of prioritizing what we think is the most awesome for you guys at any one time. Um, we like to talk, uh, we, we talk a lot about Blizzard um, universes and we're very inspired by Warcraft, Starcraft, and Diablo. 
And we like to look at Warcraft in particular because it's been around for so many years in so many ways, novels, RTSs, MMOs, card games. And we like to think, we like to hope that Overwatch is just Overwatch 1, the equivalent of what Warcraft 1 was to the Warcraft universe, that this is just Overwatch 1, and boy, I can't wait to see what comes in the future. That's awesome, thank you. <laughs> that was the last question. All right, well, thank you guys so much. We know it's super early in the yeah, morning. Coming out. We had so much fun sharing all this cool stuff, and just enjoy the heck out of BlizzCon. We hope you guys have fun. We'll see you later. See you guys.